Uh, I will tell you about this painting. This is a painting of a, a steam, coal-powered steamboat, tugboat, towing a uh, warship, a sailing warship, to its final birthing place, where it's going to be broken up for scrap lumber. And this painting, I believe, is supposed to represent the coming of the end of a sailing era and the opening of steam-powered uh, boats uh, as part of the Industrial Revolution. And so let me talk about uh, something that you don't think is associated with climate change, but it has to do with uh, epidemiology, which is the study in health of correlations. And in this um, graph, what you see is a increase in the amount of cigarette smoking uh, from 1900 to 2005, and this is the number of cigarettes smoked per, aver per capita, per person in the United States for adult males. And, and the peak in the 1960s, uh, we were a heavy smoking country, and on average, uh, if you consider all the adult males in the United States, on average, each person was smoking about 200 packs of cigarettes a year. And, um, and what was happening was that the amount of uh, deaths from lung cancer was increasing. In 1964, the signs was becoming quite compelling, and some, we started to put warning labels on the packs of cigarettes that said uh, uh, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health, followed by a ban uh, of advertising on television, then followed by magazines, followed by children weren't allowed to buy cigarettes under the age of 18, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and in the end, this did have a big impact on discouraging young people to s not start smoking. It's very difficult for older people to stop smoking. And so the smoking plunged down from a peak over here to down here. And what happened was 25 years later, uh, the number of lung cancer deaths from smoking has declined. The reason women were increasing because they started smoking later. We now know that smoking increases the risk of um, lung cancer by 25 times, coronary heart disease two to four times, and stroke two to four times. So it has a profound impact on health. Now, I'm going to draw an analogy to this epidemiology and what I call the epidemiology of climate change. And here you see a record of the temperature from 1800 to 2011. And very, very noisy data. Uh, we don't understand the bumps and wiggles. We don't understand these large plateaus. This has something to do with multi-ocean current changes. S similarly, up here, there's a plateau of 12 years. Again, uh, we think it's ocean currents, but uh, we're not sure. Nevertheless, if you just look at the data and say what happened between about 1979, 1980, and 2011 is the temperature did increase, the average land temperature. It didn't increase by that much, maybe about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees centigrade. Uh, and so let's look at what happened during that period of the last 35 years or so. This is a record of the events. Uh, it happens to be the United States, but there's a more complete record of all the events around the world that trigger insurance losses. So this is data taken by a reinsurance company, Munich Re. A reinsurance company is a company that insures insurance companies. If uh, there's an insurance company that insures for loss of homes due to floods, to fires, uh, to extreme droughts, and there's a big disaster, these type of insurance companies actually pay the insurance companies enough money so they can pay their premiums. And so what you have is this brown is earthquakes, and what you see in this record and what you see in records all around the world is that the number of earthquakes that trigger insurance losses remains roughly constant, but if you consider other things like storms, you consider floods and following floods of uh, landslides due to the flooding. Uh, you consider extreme temperature, droughts, forest fires, things like that. You see, although it's pretty noisy, there's a tendency for this to be increasing. So this is just to tell you that over the last 35 or 30 years, from 1980 to 2013, this goes up to 
part of, only part of 2013, but if you include 2013, it's up here, all of 2013. Uh, this is just to tell you, in the last 32 or 33 years, the weather has been getting stranger, also coincident with the rise in temperature. Um, it also turns out that if you look since 1950, what are the worst disasters that hit around the world? It turns out that three of them are earthquakes in Japan, in Los Angeles, USA, and in Christchurch, New Zealand. The rest are weather related, and they're very recent weather events. Again, uh, this is uh, huge losses. They are not due to the rise in GDP. The insurance company tries to take out the rise in wealth by normalizing to GDP, normalizing to also the uh, buildings being built. And so this is just weather is getting weirder. There are more extremes in weather. And so, um, so this is just one of many things that suggests that the weather truly is getting strange. Uh, now, the climate models do predict that the weather is going to get strange, but they are unable to predict exactly how strange it will be. So there is uncertainty there. But uh, there is some issue having to do with the risks involved. So let me go back to smoking. And uh, let's talk about this time delay, 25 years. What's the time delay for what we've already done in carbon dioxide, greenhouse, other greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the point is we don't know. It could be 50 years. It could be 100 years. It could be longer. Well, why could it be longer? or even 50 years. It's because the bottom of the ocean is quite cold compared to the top of the ocean. And when I was helping uh, stop the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, the top of the Gulf of Mexico was about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, almost 30 degrees centigrade. But the bottom of the ocean was one degree above freezing. All year round, one degree above freezing. It doesn't change from summer to winter. And this is just to say that the ocean mixing time, one mile deep, is very, very slow. So as you put more greenhouse gases in there, if the energy coming in is the same and the energy leaving is less, it might take a while to reach a new equilibrium. All right, so, uh, so there's also a delay uh, of uh, when you get uh, cancer and, and then there's another thing that's different. When you smoke, you put yourself at risk. When we emit greenhouse gases, mostly we don't put ourselves at risk. We put our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren at risk. So um, society so far has taken a very real kind of a relaxed attitude towards this in terms of the risks. It's all right if we can smoke, if our great-grandchildren get lung cancer, that doesn't bother us. Well, it certainly bothers me, but it should bother uh, a large part of society. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have gotten as whole as much as possible. So let me turn to what uh, oil and gas production are going to be, because you could say, well, um, not to worry, because you know, there's rising demand in oil and gas, and eventually we're going to run out of uh, production capability, and then we're going to have to find better solutions. But let me just tell you uh, where, what I see. This is the oil production of the United States from 1945 to 2012. And you see that the peak of oil production was in 1970, and it began to climb, uh, go down, even with the big Alaskan oil finds. But here in this little green slide, you see the word tight. This has to do with hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling to find oil. In the end of 1913, we were producing 7.5 million barrels a day, and by the end of 2014, we're supposed to, it's estimated we will be producing maybe 8.5 million barrels a day. So if you look at this new source of oil, what you find is it started around, uh, our U.S. production started around 4 million barrels a day, going up over 8 million barrels a day over 4 million barrels a day increase. That's a lot. If you compare that to the oil production of other countries, Saudi Arabia is more than that, Russia is more than that, and that's it. The increase in oil production is greater than Iraq, 
Venezuela, Iran, Libya, you name it, every other country. So, so it has a profound impact on our production of oil. It has a profound impact on our production of natural gas. This was uh, the actual production of natural gas in the United States, and it was forecast to decline. Uh, and this was a uh, prediction in 2008. It didn't do that. It went up to here. And uh, so, it, again, the same uh, situation. Um, but then you say, well, is this unique to the United States? And the answer is no. Where you see these uh, brown and yellow base patches, uh, these are a potential shale oil and shale gas reserves. And if you look at these, uh, what you find is it may be possible, we don't know for sure because all rock formations are different, but it may be possible that the entire world has 10 times the reserves of the United States. This is just shale oil, but then if you look at the heavy tarry oil, which is estimated to be 70% of the future oil, there's even more of that. So there's enough oil in the ground, enough shale in the ground, to say that I don't think there'll be a peak oil, not for a half a century, maybe not even for a century. Uh, it's just we can continue to produce. All right. Uh, I just want to uh, remind you of something Sheikh Yamani said. Uh, the Stone Age came to an end not for the lack of stones, and the Oil Age will come to an end, but not for the lack of oil. Well, I hope so, because there's certainly a lot of oil in the ground. Now, um, I should also say he's not the former oil minister because of, he said that. <laughs> uh, he, he was actually implicitly saying that you transition to better solutions, just as when we abandoned stones, we went to the Metal Age, the Copper Age, the Bronze Age. And so what are those better solutions? And very quickly, I'm going to talk about energy efficiency and uh, clean energy sources. Energy efficiency is better than free. It actually saves money. And this is uh, some data that was uh, assembled and analyzed by a number of ex-physicists, um, or, f well, trained as physicists uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and me. And what we did is we looked at the so-called learning curve. Every time you double uh, production, the price of uh, operation, the purchase price of uh, refrigerator goes down by a certain fraction. And so over here in the open circles in blue, what you see is the purchase price plus the price of energy and uh, for a certain size refrigerator. And what you see is after the beginning of California regulations followed by uh, United States regulations, the purchase price and the cost of operating that refrigerator uh, declined markedly. So if you didn't have regulations, it might be somewhere over here around $4,000, but it's declined to uh, one third of that cost. So that's uh, a big savings. It was always assumed by economists that if you put in um, efficiency regulations, and certainly the companies argue this, that the purchase price would increase. But as you see, the purchase price didn't really increase at all. Um, we looked at this. This is a 50-year record of refrigerators in the United States. We also looked at room air conditioners. And you see here uh, the open circles are before regulations, and then these are the reg times that California, followed by federal regulations, kicked in. And you see, ooh, look what happened. The purchase price decreased, uh, counter to economic theory, counter to what the manufacturers were telling us. Uh, we looked at clothes washers, the same thing happened. We looked at uh, central air conditioning, the same thing happened. So this tells us quantitatively that well-designed appliances standards actually don't increase the price of the appliance, they actually decrease it. And in a certain sense, you can say, well, if you have a much more efficient refrigerator or air conditioner, the compressor becomes much more efficient, it becomes smaller, and then the price goes down. But that's theory. I'm a uh, quantitative scientist, and I believe in data more than theory. Uh, an economist may say, this may actually happen in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. <laughs> So maybe it's not right. Uh, anyway, that's what uh, one of the reviewers said in our, uh, when we submitted this. <laughs>
So anyway, let me, let me talk. Uh, there are many, many things you can do in, besides appliance standards. Uh, buildings especially, factor two, decrease in the energy of buildings with no additional cost to the building is automatic if you know how to design the building properly. And so there's huge savings. But let me talk about clean energy sources. Uh, wind is getting very efficient, uh, much uh, more economical, in part because the towers are going very high, over 100 meters, and the blades are getting very big. Uh, the largest wind turbines are 126 meters in diameter. How big is that? Well, the Wright brothers' first flight was 37 meters, uh, and the Airbus 380 wingspan is 80 meters. So it's, uh, it, the large wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, dwarf the largest airplane in the sky. Um, now, there's an issue here, and this issue is these are very, very big, and if the seas begin choppy, if you had to do some servicing, if you had to replace a blade, a gearbox, something like that, it would be very difficult because these, I said, are over 100 meters tall. And so uh, that uh, early experience has shown that when these uh, large wind turbines break, let's say in offshore, it's very hard to fix them. It could be months before you're able to fix them uh, waiting for the seas to calm down. So I would suggest a simple idea. This is it. Um, here, when we build skyscrapers, you have a very flimsy crane that actually erects itself, uh, and it uses this very strong building uh, to brace itself. And similarly, you can have a s similar situation. You can actually have a crane that just latches onto this tower and lifts itself up and then uh, it moves with the tower, but the tower is very strong. And so uh, once we go to this type of technology that's been used in buildings for decades, uh, it would mean that you can service these very large wind turbines. So these are technical solutions that are uh, going to be happening and will greatly lower the cost of wind. Uh, solar energy, this is the cost of silicon modules declining again in its experience curve, every factor of 10 increase in production, you go down by a certain fraction in cost. And uh, this little bump here was due to a, a, a large feed-in tariff by Germany, so there was a temporary shortage of silicon and, and silicon modules, so the price went up. But then there was an exuberance of investment, and uh, oh, in fact, overinvestment, and the price went down. <clears throat> in fact, it went down uh, faster than the learning curve. At this point here, the manufacturers were actually, um, had to sell at below the manufacturing price, and a number of solar companies went bankrupt. The price has since stabilized. It's, it's about here uh, today, but um, in uh, probably five years or so, most of the manufacturers believe that they can sell at a profit where the module cost at a dollars per watt is 50 cents. So 50 cents versus $20 uh, in around 1975. That means the cost of modules will have declined 25 times in this period. That's as if you have a $25,000 car, but it now only costs $1,000 for the equivalent car. So the price is dramatic. Uh, thin film technologies, cadmium telluride, and other technologies are also declining very rapidly. The United States has tremendous solar resources, especially in the southwest. We have tremendous wind resources, especially over here. Um, Spain has reasonably good solar resources. Germany does not have good solar resources, um, <laughs> even though they're a leader of solar installation. And in fact, if you compare the solar map of Germany to the solar map of Alaska, they're about the same. Um, uh, Alaska is further north, but it has clearer skies. Okay, so the United States solar energy record was uh, not very impressive. It just kind of dwindled along throughout the entire 90s, throughout the 10,000s. And something remarkable happened around this time. Uh, I became Secretary of Energy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> Maybe a coincidence, but not really. <laughs> uh, so let's look at what happened uh, to prices. 
And natural gas in the United States is very inexpensive. It's about $4 a thousand BTU. Uh, Korea, it's about $15 a thousand BTU. So it's less than three times less money. And electricity generated by natural gas is the cheapest form of energy today in the United States. It can be as low as uh, $5, but uh, $50 per megawatt hour. Uh, but uh, it's usually around, maybe around $6, all right? Uh, onshore wind with the production tax credits, the subsidy is actually less expensive. It's around three or four, thirty or forty dollars per megawatt hour. But if you take out the production tax credit, it's a little bit more expensive than natural gas. Uh, but we expect, because we expect continued technical improvements, especially in reliability and higher towers. So we expect natural gas to be less expensive than, sorry, we expect wind to be less expensive than natural gas in about 10 years, maybe five years, maybe 15 years, without subsidy, including transmission. So wind is going to be competitive with natural gas. It's already significantly cheaper than coal. Coal is all the way up here. New coal, because our natural gas is so inexpensive. And so a coal has now been displaced by wind and natural gas. Uh, solar, utility scale solar with a uh, investment tax credit is up here, uh, but we expect this because of a very rapid increase to be down around this region within about 10 years. So both solar and uh, wind will be competitive with natural gas, including transmission, but not including storage. All right, so let me talk a little bit about battery technology, which is very important for both utility scale storage and also for electric vehicles. In 2008, the cost of manufacturing a battery for an electric vehicle like a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla was about $1,000 per kilowatt hour of storage, very expensive. Uh, by 2012, it dropped in half. And in 2011, we in the Department of Energy said, is there a roadmap that we can design that will allow batteries to actually decrease in price from uh, five or six hundred dollars uh, fourfold. And so we set as a target by 2022, if you can get the cost of the batteries down to $160 per kilowatt hour for automobiles, it's the battery pack, um, or the cost of utility scale storage to $100 per kilowatt hour, um, both of these become $100 billion businesses per year. Uh, when the cost of an automobile battery is, is $160 per kilowatt hour, that means you can buy a car that goes about 300, 350 miles uh, that costs $25,000. And at that point, uh, it becomes essentially what we in the United States call a no-brainer. You automatically buy the electric vehicle because it's so much less expensive to operate, and you will have very little range anxiety unless you're a very anxious person. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the target. Um, how far along are we? Well, since this time, uh, the price has dropped to $400. And uh, I watched the batteries very closely, in part because I'm on the board of directors of a battery company, and in part because I'm a scientist. I'm actually starting to publish papers in batteries also. Uh, I think um, there's a fair chance that maybe in five or 10 years, 15 years, uh, more, much more likely, we will get these batteries installed in cars. So that's very exciting. Now, uh, when I was Secretary of Energy, we started a new agency called Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy. And it was looking at very bold new things. Uh, we weren't interested in funding uh, what I would say incremental research. We were interested in funding things that could be game-changing. And uh, if you're striking out for game-changing technology, you would expect a lot of failures. And so we set up this agency to give grants to people expecting that nine out of 10 might fail. But if one succeeded, uh, that could be very significant. Uh, it was modeled after DARPA, and DARPA had many, many failures, but they had a few successes. Let me just cite two. DARPA, which was the similar agency for military, um, uh, was the 
start of the global positioning satellite system, first for the military, but now it's civilian use. That's a spectacular success that revolutionized many things in our lives. <clears throat> and they started something called ARPANET, which became the internet, which also changed many things in our lives. So these are game-changing events. So, so the question is, could we do game-changing events in the energy sector? And um, here's um, sort of a model of the philosophy of what ARPA-E was like. Uh, suppose you have existing technology. So this is the horse and buggy. And then comes along some ideas for transformational technologies. It could be a steam-powered automobile. It would be a Benz Motorwagen, which is an uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, and uh, the only trouble with this internal combustion engine car uh, was nothing except it was very expensive. And then what happened was uh, that uh, Henry Ford came in with the idea not to make expensive cars for 1% or half a percent of the population, but an automobile that was good and reliable enough and inexpensive enough that a large sector of the population could buy. And it was that Model T Henry Ford that actually became disruptive, and that displaced the horse and buggy. This would not have displaced the horse and buggy because it was just uh, for very rich people. And so, again, we seek those type of technologies. It's not only the new technology, but the cost has to be right. And so, we modeled uh, how to start RPE out of my experiences at Bell Laboratories. Um, and at Bell Laboratories, they spent nine years there. The managers were expected to be active scientists, all the way up the chain. Uh, and we're expected to do science with our own hands and our own brain, not to direct science, but actually get in the lab and do it ourselves. Uh, the funding decisions were made in days, not years. And there's no hierarchy in scientific discussions. If you're a postdoc or a member of the technical staff, you can have a spirited argument, and I witnessed this once, with the vice president of research at Bell Labs. And there, there's just uh, no hierarchy in the place. And these discussions can be quite blunt, um, sometimes bordering on impolite. Uh, people can say to each other, well, I don't think you're right. I think you're completely wrong. This is why. And, uh, but for the most part, it was not taken personally. It was a discussion about ideas, not people. And so, uh, and, and the other thing about Bell Labs was ideas were just bouncing off the walls. They were everywhere. And so we had to decide with the little time we had, I was only allowed, you know, if you're very good, you're allowed one technician and one postdoc. If you're not so good, you're not allowed anyone. <laughs> and if you're a medium, you can have one or the other. And so you, it, that encouraged collaboration, number one, uh, because you, if you needed more than one or two people, you, you would go find collaborators. But the other thing is you're constantly deciding on what you wanted to do. You didn't have a big empire could assign lots of things to other people. And so that made your, it really improved your scientific taste. So it was a, an incredible experience. Uh, 15 scientists all worked, were, who worked at Bell Labs were awarded Nobel Prizes. But the remarkable thing is that Bell Labs only hired people when they were very young, usually fresh out of PhD or just finishing postdoc work. So this is before they're famous. And, um, and in, um, let's say, my year, when the, in the basic research areas, uh, there were about eight or seven people that were hired, and uh, four of us have Nobel Prizes. Uh, over an extended period of time of 40 people over a three- or four-year period, five have Nobel Prizes. About three-quarters of the belt people hired in that time are in the National Academy of Sciences today. So the, um, the hit rate was quite high. In fact, if you don't get in the National Academy of Sciences or Engineering, you feel like a failure. <laughs> um, okay, I learned a few lessons at Bell Labs. Great people hire great people. They try to hire people smarter than them. Uh, and the people they hire are their protégés, not their assistants. That is a very big deal. Uh, it's often said, uh, but it's true, that A's hire A's. We were trying to hire A pluses and Bs hire Cs because they want people less competent than them. Uh, whereas uh, Bell Labs, we we're always looking for people smarter than us. And that was actually the litmus test. Is this person smarter than me or dumber than me? <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, lesson two, uh, it's very heavily tied to technology. Uh, Bell Labs was a technology powerhouse. Uh, they developed technology for the phone company, but they also realized in science that if you can ride on the coattails of a rapidly developing technology and develop it yourself, um, you have a much greater chance of discovering something new. Another way of saying this, if you're the hundredth person to look at the same problem with the same set of tools, the probability is you're not going to find anything new. But if you're the first person to look with a new tool, uh, the probability is quite high you will discover something new. Okay, so in actual fact, if I look at my entire career, even before Bell Labs, I was always developing new technologies. One new technology was the laser cooling of atoms. This is a picture of optical molasses around 19th, which we see. This is a, a bowl of atoms cooled to about a quarter of a thousandth of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, with that laser cooling, we could make atomic fountains. Uh, and within seven years after we demonstrated the first atomic fountain, what's an atomic fountain? You take a bunch of atoms, you throw them up, they turn around due to gravity, they fall back down. And during that whole trajectory, you can make a very precise measurement of the energy level and it made a better atomic clock. And within seven years after our first atomic fountain, it became the time standard of the world. It was that rapid uh, technology development. We also, using a similar type of geometry, made very, very precise uh, measurements of acceleration and acceleration due to gravity and rotations. And now they're uh, for the graduate student who started this project when he was with me, is now a professor at Stanford. He's founded a company uh, that makes this uh, primarily for the defense. Uh, it turns out a little bunch of atoms uh, in a vacuum chamber uh, can be a better inertial guidance system than the laser guidance systems, uh, much more accurate. So uh, here's another thing. That I did when I was at Bell Labs, we, we could trap atoms, we could trap bacteria. And so when I got to Stanford, I said, let's trap individual molecules of DNA. That's a single molecule of DNA. It's held on with an optical tweezer with a polystyrene sphere. And so this, uh, a laser directed into the optical microscope could be pointed in different directions by a motorized mirror mount hooked to the joystick. And, um, uh, this is something that was very like video games, and so my graduate students had a lot of fun doing this <laughs> in, in, until I said we should do some science. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, let me tell you another technology, not invented by me, but a profound technology. And it was invented independently by actually more than two groups, but these are the most prominent ones. Eric Betzig and Harold Hess, formerly of Bell Laboratories, now of uh, Howard Hughes Janelia Farms, uh, Xiaowei Zhang at Harvard University. What they did was they looked at uh, if you took a single fluorescent molecule and you asked what is its optical resolution, where can you find it, it's always limited by the diffraction limit of the optical microscope, typically 250, 300 nanometers. So that's the width of this blob of light. Uh, but if you ask a different question, if you ask where is the center of that light, it's actually the width of this blob divided by the signal to noise. And this is very, in this cartoon, it's very good signal to noise, and you can readily see that you can find the center of that very accurately. So suppose you find the center of that molecule and then it disappears, photobleaches, and another one appears, you find the center of that, you find the center of that, you find the center of that. Normally these uh, would overlap and you wouldn't get a very sharp image, but if you could see them one at a time, you can actually piece together a very sharp image. Uh, so that was uh, invented in 2006, published in 2006. Uh, there's another uh, form of microscopy called stimulated emission depletion, which I will not talk about, but it also has the ability to see below the diffraction limit. Um, I'm going to give you just one application of this. It was done by the, my second to last postdoc, uh, Shaolin Nan. And it was in cancer research, was, so we also enlisted the help of two cancer specialists, Joe Gray, uh, who's then at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and Frank McCormick at UCSF. So I'm going to show you a little movie from a Genetech website. Um, and 
in this movie is going to show you how a cell gets permission to divide. If there are cells in your body, they just can't divide spontaneously. Uh, if they did that, that would be very bad, very antisocial behavior. Uh, you need permission from the surrounding tissue to divide. Uh, because if you were dividing all on your own without any outside signals, we call that cancer. So this is a cartoon movie of cell division. I should warn you that many of the things in the movie are incorrect. <laughs> but it's still on the website. <laughs> and um, can I have some sound, please? Thank you. Signaling molecules GRB2 and SOS are next recruited to the internal docking site, resulting in RAS activation of the membrane. The efficiency and duration of signal transmission is regulated by the scaffolding protein kinase suppressor of RAS, KSR. RAS triggers a phosphorylation cascade involving RAF, MEK, and ERK proteins, leading to ERK activation and translocation to the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, ERK activates several transcription factors that mediate gene expression. Target genes thus act... Okay, so you may or may not know any of the meanings of those words, unless you're a biologist, um, but let's just suffice it to say that you start with a molecule on the surface of the cell. A small molecule lands on it and says, all right, begin a chain of events. And then you saw other molecules and they uh, get phosphorylation means there's a P phosphorus and four oxygens get attached to that molecule. This is a, a system used in biology all the time. Um, and so it gets this other molecule called RAS, activates it. Once RAS is activated, it uh, induces, again, chemical changes, phosphorylation of RAF, MEK, and ERK. Why are we studying this? Because mutations in RAS and RAF are uh, associated with two-thirds of human cancers. Uh, mutations in RAS, uh, particular mutations associated with over 90% of pancreatic cancer, uh, many multiple myelomas, so some of the absolute deadliest, worst cancers are caused by molecular mutations. And so what we were doing was trying to understand this cancer signaling pathway. When it, what is that actually happening when it goes wrong? Um, and so <clears throat> what, uh, there was a suspicion in this mutant form of this RAS molecule that it forms clusters. And this is raw data. All these little dots are little gold particles attached to antibodies. The antibodies would only stick to the mutant form of the molecule. And by statistically analyzing an electron microscope image of this, um, scientists began to suspect uh, recently, 2005, 2012, that perhaps these mutant forms of molecules form a cluster of five, maybe as many as eight molecules. And in that cluster, maybe they can deliver a signal to multiply. So we decided to do this with single molecule fluorescence. Uh, this is a cancer cell, and this is the cancer gene, the uh, cancer protein. And here's a super resolution picture. This is 200 nanometers. Each little red dot is a single molecule of the mutant form of RAS. And so what we did is the following. Here's the cancer gene. And then over here, we said, we want to adjust how much of this cancer uh, protein we want. And so by diffusing in an antibiotic, a tetracycline, onto this so-called promoter site, we can actually dial up the expression of the protein. You, you diffuse in a little bit of this, you make very little of that, more and more, you make more of that. So it becomes adjustable. And what we did is, at a certain dosage, we find, by just looking in the microscope at these cells, that uh, the, there's a very low density of the mutant molecule, and they're not clustering, they form single pairs. Since we can count them individually, instead of using statistical tests used traditionally, which also shows no pairs, we can say at the very low dosage of one nanogram per milliliter, they're all virtually all singles. Only a few percent are doubles and triples. When we increase the density sevenfold, we double the concentration of tetracycline, but we know how much 
increase in protein by just counting the number of dots, it increases sevenfold. We find that most of them are still singles, but maybe 18% are doubles and very few triples. But when we have 18% doubles, what we find is that this protein that diffuses into the nucleus and tells the cell to multiply, all of a sudden it gets activated as indicated by these dark lines. So this is higher and higher concentrations of the tetracycline. Uh, you make more and more of the protein, and all of a sudden, voila, it turns on. It turns on at a very, very low concentration. And so what we discovered is it's only doubles, it's not clusters, and it occurs at a very low concentration. And then we did something else. This is the mutant molecule, and I forgot to tell you a trick. We added a protein sequence uh, of, uh, that falls into a fluorescent protein. That was an innovation that received the 2005 Nobel Prize for Roger Chen. And so there's a mutant molecule of the fluorescent probe, and we added a little peptide chain, a few amino acids, that when we put another small drug in it, it will actually bind these two pieces together. And if it binds these two pieces together, it helps these two parts come together. Again, we look at very low concentrations of dots. Here, there's no, no uh, mutant f expression of the cancer protein. There's a very little. But now when we add this dimerizing agent at the same concentration, well, uh, what we find is we've turned on the signaling. So even a density below what we found before was necessary to turn on cancer signaling, if we induce the pairing artificially, it turns on the cancer signaling. And so from that, we have determined it's both necessary and sufficient to have pairing in order to get this uh, cancer signaling pathway for this mutant molecule. So um, this is the structure of this mutant molecule. This, it's embedded in the cell membrane, and there's a linker, and this is the business end. And it's just one mutation in one uh, amino acid over here in site 12 turns from one type of uh, amino acid to another, okay? Uh, and from this work, we, over, we can say, all right, we have to prevent pairing. We also did other experiments to say it's actually pairing up in this linker arm. So we need a small drug that recognizes this change in this one amino acid, but also uh, interferes with this linker arm so it cannot pair. So with that, we can go to the drug companies and say, this is what you need to do in order to look for a drug, and several drug companies are doing this now. So here's a, a clear instance where very basic research in the pathway immediately says this is the mechanism for the cancer and can tell drug companies where to search. Again, this is a very, very bad mutation that causes many, many of the most deadly cancers. And so uh, this is another example of imaging. Now, if you take a single fluorescent molecule and put it on a camera array, uh, you only have, this is each pixel of the camera array, and what you find is you're actually finding the center of this uh, position to a very small fraction of one pixel. But as soon as it was invented by uh, Betzik and Harold Hess and Xiaowei Zhang, this technique, we asked ourselves the question, what's the real limitation in the spatial resolution of this technology? Uh, suppose the camera, for example, this pixel did not register this amount of voltage, but actually was a little bit higher. And if it was a little bit higher, it would shift off the center. So could it be that the back array of the camera had little irregularities that would actually limit the spatial resolution? And so uh, we did an experiment to say, yes, indeed. Uh, we measured the irregularities. And we can then correct for it in software. And in two papers, first starting in 2010, uh, published in Nature, what we found is if we had identical biological systems in water, uh, DNA and two dyes, and we stretched them, and we had lots of photons because there were maybe 10 systems, uh, our spatial effective resolution was half a nanometer, five angstroms, okay? And uh, which was about a factor of 20 better than previous work. And even in um, 
uh, with single molecules, when we make this correction, we get about a factor of two, three times better spatial resolution. So, so this is very good because once you calibrate your camera, you can fix it in software. Uh, it, it's repeatable uh, day after day after day. Uh, so these are the previous work at that time. So, so what this tells us, if we had brighter probes and we count many more photons, we in principle could get down to one nanometer resolution. So if I look, now I took a, uh, depending on how you count it, either a 10 year or a four and a half year sabbatical from science. Um, but when I came out of my sabbatical, it's sort of like Rip Van Winkle waking up again. And uh, I took stock of uh, the probes because I wanted to go in a certain direction. And so for dyes, the number of photons you actually count are typically uh, 10,000 photons before the dyes photo bleach. If you're lucky, you, you can make, get five times more than that. And, and it takes uh, typically minutes to take one of these very high resolution images. And we also know that if you want to go to live cell imaging, that the high in intensity light that you need in the visible portion of the spectrum is, would actually kill the cells. And if you had to take um, seconds to minutes to actually form an image, the cell is actually moving. There's brownie motion in the cell. If you look at an organism, there's breathing, there's heartbeat, there's all these other things. And so you could never get 15 nanometer, let alone one nanometer resolution uh, because the cell is actually moving. And so, so the best spatial resolution was achieved on dead cells, but there were special examples. You could get similar resolution and we did this in a biofilm matrix because the biofilm matrix actually is a rigid construct. It doesn't wiggle around. And in a live growing biofilm, we were able to get comparable resolution. But that's a special case. In most cells, it's moving too much. So um, what do we want? We want to develop nanoprobes that will allow 15 nanometer spatial resolution uh, where the data taking time could be a few milliseconds. And if the data taking time is a few milliseconds, uh, much of this motion goes away. Um, so here are some applications. We are getting very interested in neural transmission at the molecular scale. Uh, if voltage spikes go down this axon, they induce uh, calcium channels to spray calcium onto a set of molecules that releases neural receptors here at the end of the axon. These neural receptors go across and they're captured on the dendritic side. And so uh, uh, I've been working with Axel Brunger for about 12 years, now 13 years, uh, at Stanford on uh, an in vitro uh, uh, systems of vesicle fusion. And in the last year uh, and a half, we started working with Tom Sudoff. Um, and so this last fall in September, uh, Mid-September of 2013, I got an idea for experiment. I told it to Axel. Uh, Axel thought it was a good idea, so he said, I said, let's go get Tom. Uh, he's a, a great cell biologist, and, and so uh, we said, we can maybe ca see in real time the release of these, uh, these neuroreceptors. Maybe we can actually see what happens on the other side, and wouldn't that be fun? Uh, and then as a joke, I said, and who knows, if this works, we could get famous. Um, uh, three weeks later, he gets a Nobel Prize <laughs> in medicine and physiology. But he's a serious scientist, and he apologized. He's going to be busy for a few weeks, but I'll be back. And he came back. So um, that has expanded. Uh, and so now Tom and I have brought together a number of people at Stanford, in addition to Tom Sudoff, uh, a former student, um, now a professor at Stanford, Steve Quake, uh, Kong Shen in biology, and Lee, Kun, uh, Lee Chin Lo in biology. And so, and that's me. And so, uh, this is the beginning of a little molecular neuro group that we've started. We meet every three or four weeks. We sit in a room and we brainstorm. And uh, every one of these people, except me, is a Howard Hughes medical investigator, but that's okay. They still like to talk to me. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. We teach each other things, and uh, I'm beginning to learn neurobiology. And uh, one of the things we'd like to do, as I said before, are, this is a synapse. This is the axon. This is the dendrite. This is that little gap. 
these colored circles are the uh, viscals. And what we'd like to do is the following type of experiment. We could get a nanoparticle. We know how to get it to endocytose. They'd be swallowed up uh, by the neuron at the edge here, over here. We then can see a transport, and there are lots of things happen when it transports. Uh, we'd also like to see it dock, and we'd like to capture its release uh, with millisecond time scale. Um, the probes we're looking at are uh, indefinitely stable. There, it, there are diamond NV particles we're trying to maximize. There are other types of probes, uh, but they're photostable. Uh, on the, once this uh, neuro set of neurotransmitters is released, there's chemical changes that occur on the backside over here on the synapse, uh, the dendrite side. And these are, the, again, phosphorylation signals. So phosphorylation is everywhere, and there are uh, half a dozen proteins that have been identified that become phosphorylated. Those chemical changes are associated with what's called long-term potentiation and believed to be part of the memory. Uh, memory is not in just one switch. It's distributed in many switches, but it's these chemical changes that are, are part of the memory. If you fire enough of these, these things get phosphorylated. So what we'd like to do is see them fire. We'd like to see this phosphorylation signal in real time. And we'd like to see it not just in one synapse, but in whole organisms. Um, one of the whole organisms we'll be working with are fruit flies. And this is the brain of a fruit fly. Uh, in case you're wondering, it's small. Uh, it's, about a half a, uh, it's about a millimeter in size, a half a millimeter in size. Uh, the fruit fly is pretty small, too. Uh, and we're studying the olfactory system, a uh, sense of smell. And um, there's some really strange things in the sense of smell. Your sense of smell is actually very, very good. Uh, it's surprisingly good. In fact, um, and dog sense of smell is even better. Fruit fly is not bad. Uh, in a fruit fly, you have sensors that can identify about 50 classes of molecules. And so they can stick with the different affinities. And what happens is those sensors feed into primary neurons that turn the binding efficiency into an electrical signal. And they go into these bundles of synapses, axons and dendrites. And then they go into a whole set of other neurons that feed right back into this. And so all they do, this other bundle is really sort of strange. Here's a bundle of these neurons. These are the sensors. Here's the this different colors or different odors. They go into this collection of other neurons that just feed back to the same bundle. And here's a bundle. And we have no idea. We, we can hypothesize what this is doing. But long before it goes to the upper brain of the fruit fly, it's going to these set of things that feed right back. And the feedback times are about tens of milliseconds. We, before we can even pretend to understand how the system works, we need to measure what it's really doing in real time if we stimulate these sensory neurons. And so the technology we seek is actually to measure when these things fire in real time. We have to put the probes on different sensory neurons. That's a, a, a major part of the biological challenge. We think we can do this. Uh, and if the probes are fast enough, we can think we can get a slice, an optical slice uh, of um, the brain to see which ones are firing uh, in um, a full optical slice in a couple of milliseconds. And so if we can do this, then we can really peek inside. Um, another thing we wanted to do is this phosphorylation, uh, to see chemical changes in cells, chemical changes when they become cancerous, chemical changes when they're actually uh, beginning to duplicate other chemical changes. Uh, we did a toy experiment in 2012 where we took synchrotron radiation, passed it through a Michelson interferometer, passed the radiation through here, analyzed the spectra, oops, analyzed the spectra. And in this case, we took what's called a PC12 cell. It's a kind of a baby neuron. And we put nerve growth factor, and the vibrational spectra changed. And so it, you can actually monitor chemical changes in a cell uh, by waiting hours and days, and you can actually see changes in the vibrational spectra uh, of these molecular changes, even though there's no external labeling. So this was just a proof of principle that, uh, golly, you can actually see what's happening. And indeed, we put it, uh, 
to a very crude uh, microscope, but the best at the time, and this resolution is terrible. This is, this is the fluorescent image, and this scale bar is 50 microns. So we only had about 30 micron resolution, but we can still see different chemical changes. Um, well, we want to do better than 50 microns. We want to do better than one micron, even though the wavelength of this light is anywhere from 5 to 10 microns. And so the first thing I did is I looked at how a high-resolution optical microscope is designed. And if you look at the very end piece, you see a, almost more than a hemisphere of glass. And so this hemisphere of glass is the final focusing element that actually makes the rays come in at very sharp angles. And so uh, I said, well, that's fine, but what if we took an infrared telescope, uh, which is not so good, and the last element of this telescope we make into a piece of germanium that you can shape with a diamond tool. Um, and it's usually the numerical, the resolving ability of the microscope, the numerical aperture is the index of refraction times sine theta, where sine theta tells you uh, how much the angle is uh, coming in. And, uh, and uh, I think I can get a numerical aperture, the equivalent of numerical aperture 1.4, but instead of using glass, uh, if you use germanium, it has a higher index of refraction. So I just take the sine theta equals 0.93 and plug in the numbers, uh, except the index refraction of germanium is 4. It's not 1.5. And so this is a cartoon. You have light coming in, and the last focusing element is this little dollop of germanium that sits completely flush on near the cell. It, this is just to illustrate that it's a, a little water-type compartment. And uh, so this is a water immersion lens, if you will, where the focal spot is very, very close to the end piece of the germanium, just like an oil immersion lens. But instead of having uh, 10 microns or 15 or 20 microns in a normal objective, uh, you can get 1.35 microns, which is pretty good. Uh, so we're in the process of trying to design and make this lens. Uh, the lens designers say there's nothing unusual about this except the idea, but, uh, but we're trying to do this. Uh, there's another thing we're going to be doing, and it relates back to a very old paper uh, I wrote in 1989 with uh, one of my graduate students, Michael Fee, who's a neurobiologist at MIT now, uh, and also with Ted Hench, who is visiting Stanford uh, uh, on a vacation. And what we did is the following. We took microwave radiation and we put it into a coaxial cable. Now, why do we want to do this? Because when you put radiation into a coaxial cable, it's irrelevant what the wavelength of the radiation is because the conductors, the center pin conductor and the outer conductor actually uh, define where the electric field is. It's still radiation because if you send a pulse uh, down this coaxial cable, it travels at the speed of light. So it's radiation, but it's radiation shaped by conductors. So we sent radiation down this coaxial cable. We had a little tip of the center conductor sticking out. We took a file and we sharpened it, and we passed it over a gold grid, 100 micron spacing. And the radiation comes down. It gets reflected back. We measured that phase shift of the reflected signal, that's E scattered, the electric field, with a reference electric field. And we looked at this cross term. And we looked at the phase shift of this cross term. And lo and behold, we see these phase changes. This is a tenth of a degree. Uh, huge phase shift, because this is you know, lots of photons. And um, this gave us lambda over 4,000 resolution. And we said in this paper in 1989, oh, you know, we can do this in the, if you work out what the conductivity of metals are and everything else, you can do the same in the infrared and near infrared. Wouldn't that be cool? Then I went back to laser cooling and trapping. Ted Hench went back to uh, measuring hydrogen, and we didn't do anything else. Um, so um, what happened? So after I came out of um, working for the government, uh, I found that some people at Lawrence Berkeley Lab actually did this independently. Uh, they took 
a piece of silicon, and it's anisotropically etched, so it naturally goes into a pyramid shape. And instead of coating all the sides with metal, they only coated two sides with metal. <clears throat> and if you coat two sides with metal, it becomes a transmission line instead of an optical cavity. And that's the essential point. This is a transmission line. It is not a cavity. And because it's a transmission line, it doesn't have a cutoff, which was the point in 1989. And what they here are the electric fields going in, and right at the tip, separated by 39 nanometers, there's a very high concentration of electric field. And so this is perfect for what we want. We want to send the radiation in. We want to reflect it back. Uh, these people, uh, Jim Shuck is the primary person, was interested in getting the light out. But uh, after I found out what he did, I said, well, no, 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 no. Uh, I sent him our 1989 paper. He wrote back very nicely and said, that last paragraph of yours had defined what everyone's been trying to do for the last five years. Um, so uh, uh, that's what happened when you're a bunch of nobodies. No one reads your papers. Uh, in any case, uh, what, since they didn't read our papers, they didn't realize that it's probably much better to look at the back-reflected signal in interference. So we're collaborating with Jim Shuck to do this, and we hope now to use this tip of his uh, to send infrared radiation down, see it come back, and we hope to get some tens of nanometer resolution, which means we should be sensitive to, you know, 100 or so vibrational um, uh, molecules in the vibrational structure. And so you could see very high resolution, we hope to see very high resolution in the infrared uh, coupled it very, with very high resolution in the visible and near infrared. And so that's our hope. Um, and so I just want to say that uh, since Lewin Hook, we've come a long way. Uh, he is the inventor of the first really good microscope. But if you no looked at his microscope, it is a single perfect sphere. He spent a lot of time trying to make very, very small spheres that are really round. And the rounder they got and the smaller they got, the better the microscope. And this is very close to the last element of our microscope, is essentially a quasi-sphere, uh, except we get to shape it with a diamond tool. Um, and so uh, it's going back to first principles. Now, um, I was asked by my wife, by others, to say something about uh, Nobel Prizes, because many of you uh, have not been to the Nobel Prize ceremony, and perhaps some of you are Nobel Prize winners in training, so you can, uh, this is what it's like. <laughs> um, it's, um, I didn't think it was a big deal until I actually got on stage, and I said, holy smokes, this is a big deal. <laughs> and um, uh, there's an orchestra in the back, and this is the stage, and uh, here you see the Nobel laureates, starting with the physicist, me, Claude Contaduji, Bill Phillips, uh, then the chemists, uh, then uh, medicine physiology, then uh, the economists. The order is very important. <laughs> 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 Physicists always come first <laughs> in every ceremony because it was the first field mentioned by Alfred Nobel. Uh, the economists always come last uh, because it's not even called a Nobel Prize in economic, it's called a uh, medal in the honor of the memory of Alfred Nobel because it was never mentioned in the will. Uh, and so that's the orders. The, sweet, the Swedish people are very tradition bound. Uh, after the ceremony, that's me uh, a lot younger, um, shaking hands with the king. And uh, afterwards, there's a big banquet. Uh, in this big banquet, is held at the old city, what used to be the Opera Hall. And there's a long table where the king and queen sit, and the Nobel laureates, and then there are guests. There are about 1,400 people at this banquet. Uh, the tickets to get to this banquet are harder to get than the Super Bowl tickets in the United States, <laughs> or the World Cup finals. Uh, it's a very big deal in Sweden. and. Um, so we uh, sit there. Uh, this is they're serving uh, dessert, and they come down. It's very uh, with a lot of flair. They come down at all these steps, and they're holding, in this case, uh, a frozen dessert uh, over there. And um, a few more things. 
at the beginning of the banquet, the king stands up and offers a toast to Alfred Nobel. And we all stand and say, to Alfred Nobel. And then we sit down, and we're all warned, after the king sits down, you sit down. You don't ever get up until the king gets up. And it will be three hours. <laughs> and most of the people who get Nobel Prizes are older men. <laughs> and so this is, can be uh, a real uh, uh, serious thing. And then before I showed up in Stockholm, news uh, stories had been, quote, leaked to us that Tycho Bray, the great Danish astronomer, was having dinner with the king of Denmark. The king sat down, he sat down. The king didn't get up, he didn't get up. His bladder burst and he died of an infection due to a burst bladder. So it was taken very seriously. <laughs> uh, it turns out there are drugs that can uh, prevent you from uh, wanting to go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, this is Bill Phillips. Uh, the physicists always sit next to the king and queen, as they should. And, <laughs> and so this is Bill Phillips uh, uh, talking to the Queen, a very, very gracious lady. Uh, and these are real jewels. <laughs> uh, and there's the king with a watchful eye. That's a little pendant of the king. Uh, and so you might ask, was I jealous because Bill Phillips uh, gets to sit next to the queen? And not really. I got to sit next to the crown princess, the one who will inherit the throne. And this is the crown princess. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I told my graduate students it's a dirty job, but someone has to do this. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>